Welcome to Talk Back. Today we will be discussing the impact of the World Trade Organization on Indian industry. India's development strategy since independence has focused on industrialization as the principal instrument to attain better standards of living for our people. From 1947 to 1990, our strategy of industrialization relied heavily on the leadership of the public sector and functioned within a closed economy framework in which foreign trade and foreign investment had a limited role to play. Indian industry has a major role to play in rising to the challenges of the process of globalization of which WTO is only a part. To discuss these issues with me, I have Dr. Shankar Acharya, the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India and a highly respected economist. Dr. Acharya received his first degree at Oxford University and then a PhD at Harvard University. Also, I have here Dr. Amit Mitra, Secretary General of FICI and an economist turned policy activist who got his first degree at Presidency College, Calcutta, my college, and his PhD at Duke University in the United States. Welcome Dr. Acharya and Dr. Mitra. When we talk of uh, WTO, the first reflex uh, that happens is that of protection and they are asking us to open up. Uh, basically, the perception of an average Indian is that in the WTO, we have agreed to a maximum limit on how much tariffs we can put on our imports. This is what we call binding our tariffs. And uh, the feeling is that why should we give up our freedom to let somebody else tell us that we cannot put uh, custom duty above a certain rate. Um, on the other hand, economists talk of efficiency arguments, why we should go in for uh, this sort of uh, negotiations at the WTO. What would be your reaction to this fear that we are giving up sovereignty in agreeing to bind our tariffs, Dr. Chadha? Well, a couple of points. First of all, every country in the WTO is giving up something when it comes to an agreement. And I think the key point there is that uh, WTO, being an international trade treaty, binds the most powerful trading nations as much as it binds, or perhaps it binds them more, as it binds the relatively weaker trading nations, amongst which we still are. Mm -hmm. The second point is when it comes to binding um, tariffs, I think you will notice that successive governments during the 1990s in India have followed, if you might call it, two-track policy. That is, we've reduced customs tariffs unilaterally, essentially because we believe that very high tariffs are bad for our economy for many reasons, including economic efficiency, which you mentioned. It also uh, protects uh, industry excessively. It hurts agriculture. It hurts exports and so forth. So we have unilaterally decided to be reducing tariffs in a phased manner. What we bind in WTO is simply the maximum level, as you pointed out, and that we bind in the context of negotiations with other countries on many topics, including tariffs. So there's give and take. Mm -hmm. um, Amit, um, in fact, a number of finance ministers have said that we must bring our tariffs down to ASEAN levels, which are much lower than the average that we have today of 30% or so. And yet Indian industry uh, uh, gets very worried about um, uh, bindings of tariffs. Would you explain to our viewers uh, what we, uh, industry means when it keeps talking about peak tariffs? First of all, we must understand that before the GATT signing agreement, our tariff rates were 71% average. And today it is 32%. That's a phenomenal decline. It could even be lower, really. Effective tariff could be even lower. Secondly, what we did is 62% of uh, items that we import, we put into the bound rates. So we gave a rate as an international agreement that we will be bound by this, at least. And the rest we put into quantitative restrictions, mm -hmm. which means you need a license. It's not simply tariff. You cannot freely yeah. import. We'll come to that. Yes. Yeah. Now, the peak tariffs 
what is interesting is to the United States if you send sugar let us say after you have fulfilled a, a tariff quota the peak you won't believe will go up to something like 167 percent the US's average tariff is only three percent they say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so peak tariff is outside of the tariff quotas for many items that they have set that means this much is okay at the normal tariff. If you bring in more, mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. escalation starts and it goes to a peak. Mm -hmm. So we were surprised to find in FIKI, our research showed that the peak tariffs could be as high as 160%. Mm -hmm. We need to modify this. Yeah. Yes. Most other developing countries that we are competing with have tariff rates of 15, yes. that is half the well, average tariff that we Yes, have. I agree. But the issue is, China began its reforms in 1985 for the industrial sector, mm -hmm. overall reforms in 79. So Korea began its reforms into market economic process and export and all this in the 70s. We began our reform barely seven to eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So what we ought to be saying is, yes, we will move in the direction of tariffs that others have, but in a calibra calibrated manner which suits the historical process. The worry today is that on the one hand we say that on balance of payments grounds we go to the WTO and we say that you allow us mm. to keep mm. the quantitative restrictions or import yes. licenses. Yes. But on the other hand when we want to encourage foreign investment we say yes. we have reserves, we have good policies, mm -hmm. we are inviting foreign investment. Yes. Uh, Shankar, don't you think there is a contradiction there? I don't think so, Isha, and we no longer take this view, mm -hmm. because if you go back in time, uh, certainly what you are characterizing as a government position would have been correct, say, in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. But since, I think, uh, the middle 1990s, government of India, at that time it was the Congress government, then it became the United Front government, successive governments have taken the view that, yes, uh, import licensing or quantitative restrictions for balance of payments reasons need to be phased out. Mm -hmm. And we had indeed in 1997 offered to our major tra uh, trading partners a six-year phase out mm -hmm. uh, of what remained. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I should say that even before that, a lot of them had been done away with for our mm -hmm. own good reasons, mm -hmm. nothing to do with WTO. Mm -hmm. But in 1997, we offered the six-year phase out. Uh, most of our major trading partners accepted this. The United States wanted a faster phase out. They took us to the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. They won the case, we appealed, they won the appeal. Net result is that instead of a six-year phase-out, we have essentially a four-year phase-out, which started in April 1997 and ends in April, April 2001. 2001. Right. Now, let me say that today, would you <coughs> agree that we are one of four or five countries in the world that has quantitative restrictions on imports? All other countries have switched to tariff protection. Well, no, this is, uh, I should clarify, mm -hmm. a lot of countries, including a lot of developed and industrial mm -hmm. countries, maintain uh, quantity restrictions on in the, the area of textiles, yes, on which we have yeah, a major correct. interest. That's true. So yes, you have to yes. leave that whole area of Leaving textiles, out, which is a very yes. big uh, aside. I'm sorry, I'm not ready to leave that out. Mm -hmm. It is unfair that multi-fiber agreement requires that quantitative restrictions will continue by the United States and Europe till 2004 December, which means practically to 2005. But we have to remove every quantity uh, no, of restrictions. But, uh, Why? Uh, Why? Because we signed an agreement. This was no, the agrees. multilateral. Agrees. So what you could say is they got away with something, yes. you know, where there was a lot of backloading and yes. they put it all off to the last day when they'll remove their QRs. In fact, 49% QRs. reduction uh -huh. on the last year. The rest yeah. of the time, it looks Peter. Again, yeah. I think, uh -huh. just, just so that your viewers uh, know the facts, see the, the this on the textiles with the backloading mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the removal of restrictions on textiles yes. uh, which mm -hmm. is of course uh, most developing countries are strongly against uh, was part of the Uruguay round package yes uh, and okay. we can certainly say that well wasn't an unfair package and so forth which we have maintained to some extent but mm -hmm. in a sense it was signed the quantity restrictions or import licensing for balance of payment reasons is a matter outside that. Exactly. Because the, the mm -hmm. these uh, licensing restrictions mm -hmm. were originally allowed in the GATT Charter for temporary balance of payments difficulties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that yes. argument lost its force Quite after 40 yes. years. Yes. And also as our balance of payments improved after the measures taken in the early 90s. And uh, so really, you know, government has taken the view, yes, we should phase them out. 
in a calibrated way and we were prepared to do so and we are doing so. Yeah. Well, if, the if government has taken a view, but I, I, if, I, if you'd allow me to, I think there is a lot of concern in the country today that on the one hand you are saying that by April 1, 2001, you are going to have no import licensing and consumer goods and other goods can come in, of course, at certain duties that will be certain imposed. Import duty okay? But the fact is, at the same time, you are not really preparing our industry to take on that challenge. Yeah. You still will have items like mango squash, uh, chili chutney, and what you, what you have, mm. which will be importable yeah. at a certain duty, but yeah. a large-scale Indian producer yeah. would not be able to produce well, that. What would you well, say to that? Well, there is perhaps a very simple uh, process. We are not saying that when we remove the license, mm -hmm. we will not put an import duty. Yes. And the industry is of the view that if you start with a 40% import duty, which mm -hmm. is more or less what our bound rates are, mm -hmm. right. it will be a reasonable protection. You think so? At least to start but with small a... small-scale industry is very worried. I think the, uh, uh, true they're worried. In fact, uh, from uh, FIKI, we are working with small-scale industry to empower them mm -hmm. rather than try to protect them. Mm -hmm. You offer them better technology, allow them to have better machines, put them in, in an integrated form with the large, like mm -hmm. the Japanese did with their small-scale yes. industry, or the yes. Thailand did. Mm -hmm. So our submission is that since we have made this, uh, this commitment to the world, that by, and now we have lost the cases as uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Acharya said, okay, remove your Q, quanti all quantity res restrictions, but move on to a tariff rate to start with, which will give you reasonable amount of time to restructure industry. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one example. Uh, may I just yeah. say, I think we have to take a break now. Okay. This is very okay. important and we'll yes. come back to that. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break. Thank you. Gushan, logon ke man ke sabal. Samay se train pa chalana aur surakshit chalana. Ayat ki zarurat bhi na rahe aur hum dariya tak ban. Heart attack jo hai, kabhi bhi ho sakta. Tambaku paida karega seedhe seedhe cancer. Ye to डिस्कसिंग in april 2001 i see a situation where from harrods you can import mango chutney or whatever yeah. squash but you as a large scale producer in india would not be able to produce this because this is an item reserved for the small scale sector shankar uh, three days ago we had this conference where the prime minister addressed the small scale sector there was a lot of expectation that while they will be given uh, incentives and support to strengthen themselves that some effort would be made to take some items out of the list of reserved products which only small scale sector uh, can produce but it didn't come and there has been a lot of disappointment what would be your reaction to this well you should, uh, mm -hmm. i think there is the, as you point out a fundamental anomaly in uh, the fact that uh, as you say uh, in these reserved items uh, they can a uh, large scale or a small scale producer abroad mm -hmm. can sell in the indian market whereas a medium and large scale indian unit cannot produce and sell in the indian market that is what reservation is about however i think you have to put this in the context that this reservation policy has been there for many years and you cannot kind of get rid of it overnight so it has to be some sort of phased approach to reducing reservation in the meantime even in non reserved products because quantity restrictions are being phased out over really a decade of which the last year is ahead of us uh, this pressure of competition will hit well, or, or press on both large scale and small scale mm -hmm. and on the grounds that the small scale units are perhaps somewhat weaker one does need to do something special which is i think the context in which the prime minister made his announcements which include more fiscal relief through the removing uh, raising the excise uh, exemption for small scale units it includes a special uh, modernization uh, subsidy 
for small scale units. So I think it has to be set in that context. That in but time reservation will go, mm -hmm. but first, given that in a year's time, even in non-reserved items, there will not be licensing protection. Uh, you have to do something. But, but Amit, uh, I yeah. thought we went through a long period when yes. all economists <coughs> were agreed yes. that these fiscal reliefs yes. uh, are the way in which you separate mm. small scale from large scale. Mm. You don't mm. need to do that. You actually need to integrate them. Yes. And don't you think we need a different kind of policy to uh, really strengthen our yes. industry to face this competition? Yeah, I, I think there are three things that are feasible to do mm -hmm. and we are hoping that in the next speech of the Prime Minister he will do it. Mm -hmm. One is those, uh, pa those items in the small scale reserve list which are not produced at all. at all. And there are many Why such can't items? we simply as a nation say look mm -hmm. it is not produced out. Mm -hmm. We hope that the Prime Minister will have a consensus because after all this is a democracy we need consensus. Mm -hmm. Number two over 600 items are in this list where we have OGL. In other words, you can simply import them, mm -hmm. which are reserved in the small scale. Mm -hmm. Second phase is, if you can import a particular component which happens to be under some kind of reservation here, why can't Indian industry be able to manufacture them? So I think political consensus among our parliamentarians across parties is possible that this is an absurd contradiction of terms, that you prevent the Indian. Mm but you allow the foreigner to bring into our country. So I think uh, the next phase will be where all parties will appear, will work towards this consensus. And third is, there's got to be a way of integrating through fiscal process, small and the large. In Thailand, small is inside a large factory, integrating. In Japan, as you know, yes. they set up a 20-year system to empower the small. Now today look at the contradiction, one of the car companies which came in much earlier to India, they put in equity into a small guy, built that up for component supply. You know what's happened now? That small guy is now become large by the reservation standards and going to lose all the benefits. Now so if you empower the small today, within her six months, eight months, the small is in a quandary because of the very low level of definition of small. So three things. One, kick yeah. those 200 out. Mm -hmm. The 600 on which there is a contradiction which no one will deny, eliminate them from the reservation and those you bring in, bring those who remain, bring into the integration package with a really innovative process as Thailand and Japan had done. One of the fears that Indian industry has, large and small, is that when you open the doors to imports, there will be the surge of imports and industry may not be able to compete. It is quite interesting that in the last four years, say from 1996-7 onwards, in each of the years, the growth of non-oil imports as a whole has in each year been less than 10%. Mm -hmm. Whereas earlier in the decade it was 25-30%. So I think the, the sphere about surge of imports as you reduce uh, quantity restrictions, import licensing, is overdone. At least the figures would suggest that. See what's been happening, one thing people don't uh, often uh, point out is during this last decade, while tariffs have been coming down and licensing restrictions have been reduced, the exchange rate has changed and has in a sense, you know, what was uh, worth 19 rupees 10 years ago per dollar is now 45 rupees. So from the point of view of an importer, it just costs him that much more to import. So he is discouraged from importing even if tariffs have come down. Yeah, That brings me to a question that I <coughs> wanted to ask you, Amit, that if industry wants some temporary protection, is it not better to give that through a slow depreciation in the exchange rate that way, what you are doing is that your uh, imports are getting more expensive, so your import substitution producer in the country gets more money, but your exporter also gets more dollars for what he or she exports. Um, whereas, uh, if we go through the protection route, then you are actually discriminating against the yes. exporter. Yes. And in this trade liberalization and finding our feet in the global economy, what we really ought to do is to push 
and strengthen our exporters to find their rightful place. Why is industry not talking about that? Well, industry has in fact been talking and uh, Fiki for one has said repeatedly that allow the rate to follow the market. Mm -hmm. Don't be overtly against market processes because ultimately this is what happened in East Asia. Excessive anti-market activity resulted in a collapse. So industry is certainly sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. But let me confess that this has to be done in multiple instruments. One is exchange rate, which will happen naturally. Second, in developed countries today, there are a large number of internal rules and regulations thrust upon imports, which we don't do. Take, for example, the uh, HACCP regulation on food exports. Now, the minute you export shrimp, they say this is not acceptable. You export leather, they say, oh, this is not acceptable. Now in the Seattle meetings, the whole labor issue came yeah. that you well, don't these, pay. These non-tariff barriers, I agree with yes. you, are very important. But as far as these uh, phytosanitary uh, yes. uh, restrictions yes. are concerned, I hope that we have more of those, not only for our exports, but even for domestic consumption. Which the industry is so, really changing, and we yeah, like that. Yeah. But you know, my point to you is that I hear much mm -hmm. more about anti-dumping duties, mm -hmm. which is a discriminatory instrument and less about exchange rate depreciation, well, which is a more neutral the biggest anti-dumping anti, anti -dumping action country in the world, which Japanese tell us, yes. is United States. Mm -hmm. Because their anti-dumping laws are yet not wholly consistent with WTO, and they say they will change it. So anti-dumping itself has become an instrument, in addition to where tariffs are not there, as a form of trade re market access restriction. So yes. they have the textile quota, so we can't our greatest strength textile. Mm -hmm. Gems and jewelry recently, we reached the quota in the United States. They did not extend our quota, but they did extend Thailand's and Oman's quota last week. So there again we can negotiate. And interestingly, anti-dumping mechanism in India has to be strengthened. It has, I must say, has been strengthened in the last one year significantly. As a definite point, I don't think it is anti-market at all. What you are yes. saying is that somebody else is able to send a product, export a product to us, which is half the price of what an Indian producer can produce, mm -hmm. but you say they are unfairly mm -hmm. sending it here and mm -hmm. you should therefore put duties on these products such yes. that the price becomes as high as what the Indian producer gives. Now, as a consumer, yes. I would say you are discriminating against the most efficient producer, and this is, to me, backdoor protection. No, but Isha, I think you have yeah. to be uh, careful there, because um, it is not, uh, under uh, anti-dumping uh, rules, the real issue is not whether uh, the exporter abroad is necessarily the most efficient. The real point, there are two really tests. One is, is he, is he underselling compared to his own costs? Mm -hmm. uh, you're right, the, our consumer may benefit from that, but then you, know, you have to bear in mind the interests of our domestic producers to some extent, mm -hmm. I would argue. Secondly, the issue of injury. You have to show material injury. So I think uh, there is amongst most sort of economists, trade specialists, a view that anti-dumping does have some logic, but if uh, trading nations resort to it excessively, whether it's US, whether it's India, whether it's Korea, whoever, then it does undermine the whole spirit of the international trading arrangement. Now take the case of China. We have to prove that the Chinese are dumping and China itself has no published data on their cost structure. That's true. Because of their yeah. whole internal process. So if you didn't have it, today the chemicals industry is in very great stress due to Chinese uh, products, which we suspect, I mean, industry suspects, is well below their uh, cost of production because we don't know what their costs are. Mm -hmm. US has 300 officers handling dumping. Yeah. We, have, sure we have only four. Cool. Yes, but we also have scarce resources. <laughs> uh, but I would like a last comment from each of you on how in the context of trade liberalization and gaining market access, you see India and Indian policies strengthening Indian un industry to cope with this? First well, you. I think uh, since this is about WTO, mm -hmm. we must remind ourselves that one of the great benefits of an international agreement like WTO is it controls the protectionist behavior 
of the largest markets in the world. True. And that is the best hope mm -hmm. for market access. Mm -hmm. There will always be irritants, you know, which are tilted specifically against developing countries or individual countries, and we must certainly fight against them. And provided we have a case, we should take it to the dispute settlement uh, authority. But we also gain from WTO as a message, which is, I think, fundamentally important, because we gain market access. Uh, there are obviously a lot of other things that we need to do domestically. We should have policies which encourage efficiency. Uh, he mentioned about the whole reservation area. That's one clear area we have to think ahead much more and do something. Uh, there's the issue of labor laws, which is a touchy area, but it is one which does dilute the competitiveness of organized Indian industry. And there are many other such areas. Uh, we need to make our industry much more competitive. I mean, there is no question that market access in some areas have really gone up in the new uh, tr um, world global trading environment. Take, for example, software. We have no software exports. Today we have, uh, we have become a world leader in some people's minds due to market access. Even in textiles, we are meeting our quota. Gems and jewelry, we are exceeding. We are just meeting our quota. Now, once the multi-fiber agreement goes, if we are efficient, and I mark these words, if we are efficient, we can grow. But if we are not, East Asia will take what we had as a quota protection. So we have done a very major study. So my submission is, there's got to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Market access in developing developed countries for us has its own limitations in some areas, textiles, uh, gems and jewelry and others has tremendous opening in other areas, like the knowledge-driven industries of tomorrow. So maybe we should restructure ourselves a little bit to penetrate global markets more effectively in those areas where it's possible. So the message is clearly that we can't sit back. We have to work domestically to improve our competitiveness. Absolutely. We have to become proactive. Yes. And as we gain economic strength, yes. we will be more effective in negotiating in the WTO. So it, WTO is not something that we need to be afraid of, but we must make it serve the purpose for which we are all working, which is development in our own economy. Thank you very much. We'll be back same time, same day next week to discuss more on the WTO. Thank you. Welcome to Talk Back. I'm Ishar Aluvalia, 
In this series of programs, I will be discussing the impact of the World Trade Organization agreements on the Indian economy with economists, scientists, industrialists, and policy makers. Today, the topic of our discussion is the trade-related intellectual property rights regime under the WTO. Let us first take an overview. Intellectual property rights are intangible rights an owner has over his or her creations, inventions, and ideas. The Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, or TRIPS, is now part of the World Trade Organization regime. There are eight areas of intellectual property rights, or IPRs, covered by TRIPS. Patents, plant variety protection, copyrights, trademarks, geographical indications, industrial designs, layouts for integrated circuitry, and undisclosed information. India had a system of process patents. These protected only the process by which the product was made. In the case of pharmaceuticals, for instance, anyone could reproduce that product at a cheaper price by using a slightly different process in its manufacture. India amended its Patent Act in 1995. We now have a system of process and product patents for all products for a 20-year period. Process patenting will take effect from January 2005. Perhaps the most important area of concern is genetic resources. The Patent Act of 1995 brings all biotechnological inventions and eligible microorganisms under its ambit. However, plants and animals themselves are not covered by patents. Thus neem, turmeric, basmati rice, jeera seeds, karela, brinjal, and some of their properties were patented by multinational firms, although they are indigenous to India. Patenting of germplasm for seeds is an area of major concern for farmers of developing countries who may lose their access to native genetic resources. In India, a draft Plant Varieties and Farmers' Rights Bill is being debated to address these concerns. While stronger IPR protection should increase incentives for innovation, it would also raise the cost of acquiring new technology, thereby slowing down the process of technology diffusion. The debate goes on. The most controversial area under TRIPS have been pharmaceuticals and agriculture. To throw more light on this subject, let us turn to our guests. I have here Dr. R. A. Mashelkar, one of our most respected scientists in the country and currently head of the CSIR. Dr. Mashelkar has many credits, but one of the things he's most known for is the fact that we, I can say proudly he was elected fellow of the Royal Society. I also have with me here Another very distinguished guest, Mr. Muchkun Dube, former Foreign Secretary and current President of the Council of Social Development. Mr. Dube is highly respected in the country for his thinking and articulation of the views of developing countries when it comes to analyzing global economic developments. Welcome. Muchkun, if I were to put a very simple question to you, would you say that under the new intellectual property rights regime that we have, it is going to be much more difficult and much less affordable for an average Indian to have access to essential medicines? Yeah, that's very true because uh, uh, most of the life-saving drugs uh, are under patent and they are likely to be in patent in future also. Indian uh, pharmaceutical firms used to produce the same drugs by using different processes, uh, which is called reverse engineering, or some people would call it uh, pirating, and used to make those drugs available at prices which were one thirtieth, sometimes one sixtieth of the prices prevailing in the markets of the developed countries. Once the process patent only regime for drugs is done away with, and the product patent is introduced, uh, then uh, uh, these drugs we will have to import uh, from these companies or 
uh, to the extent that they agreed to produce it, if they had incentive to do it in the country. And I think that uh, one immediate result of that would be a sharp increase in the prices. Would you not say, Dr. Mashilkar, that we have uh, both the WHO, which has produced a list of essential medicines, and then in our own country, the government has a list of essential medicines. And to my knowledge, there is no patented drug which forms part of that. I remember the 1998 statistics, only two drugs were under patent, and those also are out of patent at the moment. And at least the 1998 figures were that uh, the production based on those two drugs was about 7 crore or something of that order. The other issue is that there are something like 20 to 25 new drugs that come in every year around the world, basically. But at the same time, similar number go off patent, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So there is some internal equilibrium and balancing. Equally importantly, there is an alternative that is always available. There is such a competition, for instance. I mean, if one is uh, prescribing ciprofloxacin, there is an alternative of uh, chloramphenicol or tetracycline mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. That means these alternatives will always be available. India uh, has an enormous advantage because of its intellectual infrastructure, our mm -hmm. strong research and development mm -hmm. uh, capacity. We are taking advantage of the fact that uh, the cost of research in India is very low. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's not forget that last mm -hmm. year the research and development budget of entire India was $4 billion, space, defense, atomic energy, everything. Mm -hmm. The budget of one company, Siemens, was $5 billion. And you can see what we are doing. So that tremendous cost yeah. advantage that we have, mm -hmm. we must leverage. So I think if we strategize properly, we can basically make it. The only thing is that we cannot run the entire mile on our own mm -hmm. because when you move from mine to marketplace, the costs are very high, mm -hmm. you know, 400, 500 million dollars, which we don't have. But on the other hand, by participating in that innovation process mm -hmm. and forging mm -hmm. partnerships, we can do it. Mujkun, do we have some instruments by which we can uh, ensure that there is technology diffusion that we are, you know, patents don't amount to just protecting technology. The most effective instrument to do something about that is the system of compulsory licensing. Mm -hmm. And compulsory licensing basically means that uh, if the patent holder uh, does not make the commodity or drug available in sufficient quantity on a continuing basis or does not manufacture it in the country for a long period of time, the government has the right to give license to others, including the patent holder, mm -hmm. to produce in the country. Don't you think, Dr. Mashilkar, that a lot of uh, the R&D in the developed world is going into research on like old age diseases, whereas our diseases really are age old diseases, I would say. And is there really, is there not enough room for us to work on, you know, uh, uh, medicines for dysentery, cholera, TB and all? Or is there really as much of a conflict as is being projected today? You are absolutely right. I mean, uh, the Western world will work on the diseases of the Western world, mm -hmm. on the diseases of the Western mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm. whether it is cancer or mm -hmm. coronary problems or uh, mm -hmm. aging and so on. Mm -hmm. Nobody is going to work on malaria, filaria mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. These are our problems. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely why we need to create a strong research and development infrastructure, particularly our publicly funded R&D institutions, mm -hmm. they need to work. I mean, I'll give an example, since you talked about, mm -hmm. let's say, malaria. Mm -hmm. It was our Central Drug Research Institute which developed rt which is the only drug that is available on cerebral malaria today. I see. Essentially, mm -hmm. it is being marketed, yeah. it is being used around mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Prime Minister launched mm -hmm. it last year. Mm -hmm. And the new drug that has uh, entered, ablaquine, for instance, once again, CDRI, mm -hmm. Nicholas Spiron mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, they invested uh, heavily in that, basically. Mm -hmm. So I do feel that the tremendous intellectual infrastructure that we are creating within mm -hmm. the country, mm -hmm. if we use it intelligently, mm -hmm. and particularly with the kind of support the government is now providing mm -hmm. through this, it is possible. But Dr. Mashilkar, is the government really providing the kind of support that is needed if our knowledge industry is to be competitive? in the world because I understand that we still have not really got a state-of-the-art patent office in the country. Yes. So on the one hand we say, you know, yes we have the uh, ability to create knowledge but then people are going from pillar to post in order to get their, uh, uh, you know, uh, product patented. Uh, what would you say, Mr. Would you share this perception? Yes, I entirely share that perception mm -hmm. and I think that uh, some of the basic uh, infrastructure and institutional uh, mechanism that had to be created uh, has not been 
created mm -hmm. and uh, whatever has been done is not adequate. Mm -hmm. And we already have had uh, five years mm -hmm. and we have just about two, three years more to go mm -hmm. before we are required to implement mm -hmm. the TRIPS agreement fully. Mm -hmm. And if we do not implement, then we can be dragged to this settlement mechanism. There is a lot of apprehension about the fact that, you know, we have such tremendous heritage in the country. You know, we have the whole Ayurveda heritage, homeopathy, all these alternative systems of medicine. And we don't have the capability and the infrastructure to patent these. And what is going to happen, people feel, is that the multinational corporations are going to come and they're going to use their resources to patent our material and then we will have to pay a higher price for that. What would you uh, say to that? I think let us uh, talk about the perception and the reality. Hmm. The perception is neem is being patented, turmeric is being patented and so hmm. on and so forth. Nothing like that. Hmm. Because no natural product as hmm. such ca can be patented. Hmm. Patent has to have this basic uh, criteria of novelty, non-obviousness and utility. Mm -hmm. I think the basic issue mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. that we have to create databases mm -hmm. on what we have. We just can't keep that knowledge up here or in mm -hmm. some buried books mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. But in databases that are accessible mm -hmm. to the whole world including the patent offices mm -hmm. so that they know that we have the rights mm -hmm. on this. I think that yeah. is the current. No, I must say this, uh, your winning of the new patent was a major uh, morale booster. Yeah. Today, while it is true that we have won some of these battles, the fear is that we still don't have all that is needed to make uh, our indigenous systems of medicine really patentable. Would you agree with that? No, I agree with that. And mm -hmm. I would agree with uh, Dr. Mashalkar that we need uh, uh, to have an inventory mm -hmm. of what we really have mm -hmm. and to collect all the material relating to that so that it can be used in any court or appeal where we have to go to protect our interest. Mm -hmm. But TRIPS agreement is under review mm -hmm. and we have a few uh, things uh, which were not envisaged at that time mm -hmm. and which uh, we should bring up. And one of them I would say mm -hmm. that for example regarding geographical names, mm -hmm. the TRIPS agreement provides a higher intellectual property level mm -hmm. uh, for spirits and wines. But it doesn't make such provision for other geographical names. True. Like so, Basmati. Basmati. Yes. So this is one of the obvious things that we should press for. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we should press for is uh, how do we exercise our rights under the Biodiversity Convention mm -hmm. uh, in the revision of the TRIPS agreement. Mm -hmm. And there are two issues I will just mention very briefly. Mm -hmm. One is that uh, uh, to recognize the right of the community mm -hmm. who have the knowledge yes. of the traditional mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And second, of course, is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, paying compensation to the farmers Correct. who have brought these plants to the present stage of development. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mutkun. We will be discussing this and more in the second half of the uh, program. Stay with us. We will just take a short break. Thank you. موسیقی Welcome back. We are joined in this part of the program by Dr. Suman Sahai, President Jean Campaign. Dr. Sahai has been a very effective scientific voice in favor of farmers' rights and community rights. Suman, welcome to this program. Uh, tell me, how does TRIPS, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Regime, affect the farmer's ability to buy seeds and use these seeds for further cultivation? The TRIPS uh, demands of member states that they should provide a legislative system to protect the rights of breeders of new seeds. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it does not restrict the right of the farmer to buy seeds, but what it does very severely restrict is the right of the farmer to be, function as a seed producer himself. Mm -hmm. This assumes tremendous significance in a country like India, 
where the largest amount of the seed produced for our annual consumption, as much as 85 percent, 87 percent by some estimates, is produced by the farming community. Because we don't have the corporate sector in main food sure. seed. And therefore, you could say that India's largest food, uh, in, excuse me, largest seed industry is the farming community. Mm -hmm. And if you place restrictions on what the farmer can do with the variety, like maybe the farmer can save seed for himself, maybe the farmer can produce seed for others, these are the kind of requirements that are there in TRIPS which would restrict the right of the farmer to function as India's largest seed industry. But mm -hmm. if I may just continue on that, happily, the Indian legislation that is being drafted the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers' Rights Act, because it has been referred to a parliamentary committee, because several people, experts from within government and without have been invited to give views, I must say that this draft legislation is moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And our earlier concerns, and Gene Campaign had several concerns mm -hmm. on farmers' rights, these are being addressed. Now we will wait and see what is there in the final form, but I think the crux is the farmer must retain the right to sell seed even seed of a uh, protected variety. So that's very good news. Yes, that it is. We, there was tremendous apprehension a few years ago. Yes. And what you're saying is that we have made some progress in the right direction. And, uh, in another area that you have been very vocal uh, about is the community rights question. And Dr. Mashilka, earlier on in the program, we were talking about community rights and people's knowledge. And I believe that there have been some very significant developments in recent months, not only in India, but even in developed countries. I'd like you to tell us more about what has happened in this area. Yes, and uh, I'll do so very happily because it all begins with uh, this very small step India had taken on challenging that particular turmeric patent. Right. You'll recollect that uh, the use of turmeric for wood healing has mm. been known in India for centuries. Right. And yet one fine day one found that there was a U.S. patent that was granted on that. And it was CSR which decided to challenge it. And I'm very happy to say that after 14 months, the U.S. Patent Office revoked that patent. And that changed the mood in the country. That changed the mood in yes. the country because yes. what happened was, the feeling was anybody can come and take away our knowledge uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, put a right on it. but. Uh, this proved that that is not so. It also showed that there is a system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that basically worked. It gave us a new confidence. And also the more important battles. Because turmeric was symbolic, right. where the more important was basmati, where right. uh, our uh, exports would have been affected and so on. And I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that after this particular uh, patent was broke, there have been other good developments, like the neem patent, for which there was a fight that was going on. Twelve organizations had put a fight for about five years. Mm -hmm in the European Patent Office, that was revoked uh, mm -hmm. around uh, two to three months ago. Mm -hmm. And there was another development. It's not only India's problem, by the way. Mm -hmm. There were 400 tribes in Amazon. They were using a particular plant called Ayahuasca mm -hmm. uh, for uh, certain purposes. And again, there was a wrong uh, US patent. That was challenged by them, citing the turmeric case. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that that was also revoked. So what has happened is that it's not only the developing world. In the developed world also, mm -hmm. there is a more awareness now. And I'm very happy to say that the government of India, particularly mm -hmm. the uh, Department of Indian System of Medicine mm -hmm. uh, and Homeopathy, led mm -hmm. by uh, Shailaja Chandra, yes. has taken this uh, particular initiative to create what is called as a traditional knowledge digital library. So what will happen? Mm -hmm. All this knowledge, which mm -hmm. is buried now in Sanskrit texts here or there, etc., mm -hmm. that will get converted will into it digital take years to do No. That? What we are doing is mm -hmm. the 80-20 rule always applies. Mm -hmm. That is, 80 percent of the patents are given on 20 percent of the plants and right. remedies. So we are picking up those first, which will okay. solve uh -huh. uh, the major uh, problems. Uh -huh. And I think within less than a year, that uh, library is being put together. Suman, so do you share that optimism? Yes. I think uh -huh. the uh, setting up databases is a very important step. But I would like to introduce a word of caution. The way that WIPO is going ahead with the database treaty, we'll have to be very careful about protecting this database. WIPO is the UN body which looks after world intellectual property rights. Correct. So this has been dealt with all patents and copyrights, etc. all these intellectual property right things, has been dealt in WIPO so far, uh, till it was moved into TRIPS because Correct. of a very aggressive stance in the WTO. Right. But WIPO is trying to reclaim that ground. Mm -hmm. And in the WIPO, a treaty is being discussed, an international treaty, which will govern databases, all mm -hmm. compilations of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, like Dr. Mashilkar was saying, and in all fields. Mm -hmm. And all developing countries would be much happier mm -hmm. 
if intellectual property rights would be with the UN organization mm -hmm. like WIPO rather than with WTO. But it's it's unrealistic. I don't think mm -hmm. so. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the Do way think? that it is mm -hmm. developing, mm -hmm. uh, WIPO is trying and I think successfully trying yeah. and it would be in our interest of course, to yeah. strengthen yeah. that kind no, of thing. What has been completely neglected in this international discussion is that there is a whole body of knowledge that communities have, mm -hmm. the indigenous knowledge, mm -hmm. the traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. What is at the basis of a lot of biopiracy? Mm -hmm. Now, whether it is intended biopiracy or accidental biopiracy is a different matter. Mm -hmm. But the fact that this indigenous knowledge is a big money spinner. Mm -hmm. It is because wound healing properties exist in turmeric and communities have that knowledge that somebody thought to patent it. How do you formalize the system? And what is really the onus on developing countries today mm -hmm. is to start thinking afresh and creatively mm -hmm. to create instruments of protection. Like mm -hmm. you have a patent for the industrial sector, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. create instruments like that that would protect indigenous knowledge. Because indigenous knowledge is not by, held by one person, it's by mm -hmm. communities. It has been created over a period of time rather than just one single invention. Mm -hmm. So the whole invention in this formal sector of industrial properties, which is protected by patents, is a completely different system. Can you give some example of what kinds of protection you can have for uh, community knowledge? Well, uh, there are several alternative ways mm -hmm. of uh, basically doing it, but mm -hmm. the principal point mm -hmm. is the patent system mm -hmm. which originated to patent, let us say, industrial property. Mm -hmm. Just by a design on a paper, a mm -hmm. drawing on a paper, you mm -hmm. could protect it. It's mm -hmm. no more valid mm -hmm. if uh, Michael Jackson is going to use, let mm -hmm. us say, mm -hmm. an African tune in right. a song. Who originated that? Mm -hmm. And what is the compensation that is being mm -hmm. given? Small experiments are beginning to take place, by the way, very quickly. In a minute, mm -hmm. I'll tell you about mm -hmm. an experiment that was done in India. Mm -hmm. For instance, Dr. Pushpangaram, who is now the director of National Botanical Research Institute, when he was in Kerala, when they went to a Kan tribe, uh, they found that there was what was called as Arugya Pacha, mm -hmm. a plant which the tribes used to eat and they wouldn't feel hungry for the day. Yes, yes. So he said, what is this? They collected mm -hmm. it, uh, mm -hmm. created a product called Jivani out of mm -hmm. it, started uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, commercializing it. But what they did was important, that they recognized that the knowledge came from the tribes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they created a trust in which 50% of the royalties that they got uh, were put in for the benefit of, uh, of the, the tribes. tribes. I mean, these are new models that are emerging. Right. So mm -hmm. it's the question mm -hmm. of material transfer agreements, access to information mm -hmm. as well as material, and compensation. Mm -hmm. These are small examples. I think we need to, what, that's what Suman is saying, I'm saying. Yeah. We need yeah. to create so, a would you say, Suman, that like if we our biodiversity is being threatened, if we feel that our biological material is going to be, you know, taken away by the multinational corporations, they come and they patent it, and then we have to pay a heavy price to reclaim it. Uh, would you say that some kind of a system can be set up where we charge royalties in case uh, you know they have access to that because? It does, you know, you also have to uh, remember that if there is a lot of foreign investment that comes in uh, to explore these possibilities, uh, and if we don't have funds, should we set up regulatory systems where we can use the investments to really exploit the potential but make sure that our biodiversity is not threatened, or should we just shun foreign investment from this area? What would you say? I don't think that the question is that of shunning or accepting foreign investment. Mm -hmm. I think you'll have to tackle this both at the national level through domestic legislation, where mm -hmm. you will have to put mm -hmm. protective measures like mm -hmm. what can be used, what mm -hmm. cannot be used. This mm -hmm. is already part of the Biodiversity Act. Mm -hmm. And you will have to lobby and negotiate internationally. I must add here that, again, our own Biodiversity Act mm -hmm. has attempted to be proactive in this case. Mm -hmm to say that this knowledge should be used sustainably and equitably. There is a concept of benefit sharing, that royalties will have to be paid. And there is a national biodiversity authority in which Adivasis and farming communities will directly be members, so as to safeguard their interest directly. And that they, this kind of question of whether it will be patented or not will be decided by the authority. What sort of royalties mm -hmm. will be paid? will be decided by the authority. So the concept yeah. that you're raising is yeah. actually coming yeah. into being. Mm -hmm. But Suman, it is one thing to say that we need legislation to address these very genuine issues, and we are moving in the direction of getting the right legislation. But it also requires an enforcement machinery, and it requires a mindset. Would you yeah. say that we've created that mindset? We need a lot of awareness generation. Yes. And I'll give you an example of where you'll run into problems. 
In India and in many communities in old civilizations, communities do not have the concept of exclusive ownership. There is always willingness to share. I think the dilemma is to retain uh, the kind of nobility that communities yeah. have, exactly. but still protect their interests mm -hmm. in the sense of providing the kind of uh, legislative framework. But I must say that no enforcement of any law is possible unless you have massive awareness generation. Yeah. Do you think, Dr. Marshalkar, that our uh, IT uh, enthusiasm can really be applied in this area? IT has the power to reach the unreached. The central issue is like this. India is being described as a rich country where poor people live. Mm. What is our richness due to? Mm. Our rich biodiversity, our traditional knowledge, our enterprise, our culture, mm -hmm. our heritage and so on. It has the potential to create wealth mm -hmm. through the process of innovation. Converting knowledge into wealth and social good through the process of innovation is a challenge. So you believe and we can export knowledge? Absolutely. In doubt. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No doubt at all. And mm -hmm. that is beginning to happen. Yeah. <coughs> Our village in Gujarat, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. is craft. Mm -hmm. He's on craftbridge.com, which was mm -hmm. put by NIT. Mm -hmm. And an American is having an access to it. And he's uh, uh, deciding the design, the weave, and the fabric. And it is getting connected. Mm -hmm. And it's a question of using modern tools, mm -hmm. namely information mm -hmm. technology, modern biotechnology, mm. put it all together, mm. basically. To me, this is a huge mm. opportunity. And the second point is that we keep on talking about biopiracy. Mm. Biopiracy does not necessarily take place between India and the Western world. It takes place right here. Yes. Mm. Some of our laboratories might take yes. things uh, from mm. our people without mm. returning anything. And therefore, not biopiracy, but biopartnership, I think should be the signal that we should be sending. Biopartnership. Yes. Very good. We really need to work both on the infrastructure front and on awareness front. So I really must thank you for sharing your perceptions with us. Thank you.